Welcome back all. So today I am going to show you the for each loop. Now what you see on the screen here are some fairly new concepts and let me just bring my notes up on the other screen. So first of all you have this, an unknown. This here, this is the for each loop, this here as well, this here as well, and this is just the for loop. And yep, let me just format this a little bit. There we go. So anyway, the reason why I've actually written out the code and I am doing the lecture over the written code is because, well, uh, somebody decided to turn on a vacuum in the middle of my previous cast, and I was kind of hoping that the sound wouldn't reach this room, but unfortunately it did, and I wasted 20 minutes of my life that I will never get back. <laughs> anyway, for each loop. Now, to explain this type of a loop, we first need to know what container types are. For now, let's say that we know what arrays are. And we will learn about them in the later chapters, or in the later chapter, if I'm not mistaken, so that we can, but we need to, we need to assume that we know them in order to be able to explain the for each loop. Now, for each loop is specific to C++ 11 standard, so you do need to go into settings, uh, compiler, and toggle this flag here. So it says, have G++ follow the C++ 11 ISO C++ language standard. It just Go ahead and click on it. You can you can read about it later if you want. You can expand this area, and you can also read on the net what C++ standards are, 11 standards are. Click on OK. Anyway, so as I said, I didn't want to make an obsolete course that is uh, for C++ as it was back in the day. I wanted to make a course that would show you how C++ is it today and include pretty much all the latest features which are all the latest features that I could. In fact, there are some features from C++11 in the Keylogger course that are, I mean, it hasn't even been a month since the features have been enabled in the official compiler. I'm not actually sure about that. Anyway, so the for each loop is only for C++11. For C++11. And as I said, we are going to assume for the, ti for the time being that we know what arrays are. I will talk about them later on. Basically, this is an integer array. This is a double array. Uh, an integer array is basically just a culmination of integers. You have 5, 4, 1, 2, 3, minus 2. And double array con uh, consists out of 1, 1, 2, 2, 6, 1, 3, 5, etc. and so on and so forth. They consist out of elements enclosed within these curly brackets. Now, uh, they are indexed. Each one of these numbers actually has a position, and the positions begin like this. So, 1, 1 would be at a position 0. 2, 2 would be at a position 1. This is position 2. This is position 3. So, 0, 1, 2, 3. Four numbers in total. Sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. So, you have 0... One, two, three, four numbers, four elements. It doesn't have to be four numbers, four elements in total. Four numbers because this is a double array, but uh, array of type double, and we know what type double is. But it could have been a character. We could have had characters. We could have had an array of strings or whatever, a lot of things. So each one of these numbers could have been like a word. Each one could have been a word or something like that. It doesn't really matter. There are so many variants here. It's hilarious. Anyway, that is irrelevant. What I needed these. I needed these types. I needed to include them here because I needed to explain what for each loop was. Without them, it would have been kind of difficult, or should I say, probably impossible to an extent. I could have chosen to use more complex types, but I've just chosen to use these for my for explanation purposes. As I said. Uh, take take what you know now, and you would basically access these elements by typing in ARR, uh, I don't know, let's say 0. So this would be an equivalent of number 5, or the first element of the array, as the index begins from 0 and not from 1. I will explain this in more depth later on. Anyway, so let's go to the subject of this tutorial, into the for each loop. Now, here you can see the syntax of the for each loop, which roughly translates as for each element in container or collection. So you have for, and then you have a parentheses open. 
you specify some sort of a type here and then you specify the variable name, you use a colon and then you specify the container of your choosing. Our container will be the variable int rr, the array. Anyway, this particular example will print out each element of the array in the next row. So that is, variable i will hold the value from each element of the array. So you see here for each iteration, it will go like this. I will be, I don't know, I will be zero. And then it will print, the, then you will have a printout of, sorry, ARR zero, which will be equivalent to number five and so on and so forth. You don't need to specify a range or anything like that here. Uh, you just, you just uh, use the container and then you use the variable for iteration. You don't need to initialize it or anything like that. It just stands for each element. It begins from zero and it goes to the end. That's it. So you have the you have the you have that variable which you will use for uh, iterization or whatever you wish to call it. And here you have the container over over whose element over whose elements you wish to iterate. So you will go one element at a time. It will begin from the index zero and it will end wherever the array pretty much ends. Simple as that. Now it will print it, it will print them out onto the screen and it will go into a new line for each printout. The same thing will happen here, except here we're using a double instead of an int. So you see it's an int here and we're printing out ints onto the screen, but here we're printing out doubles. And we can also use the auto keyword that we have learned previously to automate to detect the type in an automated fashion so we don't have to actually specify the type. This is going to be very useful later on. All three of these examples pretty much do the same exact thing. Uh, these two are exactly the same. Uh, the only difference between them is the types that they're using. And this one is somewhat of a different as it has a generic type. So this can be pretty much, I, uh, the ARR2 can be pretty much of any type. It can be a double, it can be an integer, it can be a floating point, it can be whatever, whatever is allowed, so to say. And down below, I have used a for loop in order to demonstrate how the for each loop would look how what we have done with the for each loop would look like if we have done if we had done it with a for loop. So as you can see here, we begin at index zero. We set the condition that i is lesser or equal to five, and then we iterate over the well, then we iterate the i by a fact by a factor by one, and then we print it out. We print out the first element of the array, then the second, then the third, fourth, fifth, etc. etc. Now this array has one, two, three, four five, six elements. So why is i lesser or equal to five here? Hmm, what do you think? Well, because the iteration starts at zero. So count with me here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five. That's six numbers, if you include the zero. Therefore, the boundary is five. Size of the array is six, meaning we have, it contains six elements and therefore we want to iterate over all the six elements, meaning from zero to five. It's a little bit counterintuitive, yes, but it's not that much of a problem. You get the hang of it and you get used to it. So down below, we're printing out, i first has the value of zero and arr zero, that's just five, and then i changes to one, and that's four, and changes to two, that's one, etc. so on and so forth. So let's go ahead and compile and run this. And there you go, you see how this uh, first printout occurred. So this is five, four, one, two, three, and minus two. So this we are looking at the first for each loop. And as you can see, it worked flawlessly, perfectly. Each element of the array was printed out. Second loop that we are looking at is double. Again, the printout is correct. I assure you, you can go ahead and check it out for yourselves if you wish, choose, or prefer either way. And finally, the third printout that happened, well, not finally, but the third printout that happened was four, but with auto generic type, uh, with auto key by using auto keyword for uh, detecting the type in an automated fashion. And it's basically begins from one, one, two, two, six, one, 
three, five. And down below, we just have a demonstration of the for loop, how it would look like if we had done it with a for loop. And here you have the printout uh, that for which the for loop was used in essence. Now let me just show you one more thing that I wanted to do here. You see, just to, just to show you, for each loop is C++11 exclusive. So if we go into compiler, and if we disable this, what we have enabled previously, and if we try to build and run, okay, it does. <laughs> Uh, wait, wait, wait. I think I need to reset the... Uh, computer... Uh, it's, it is disabled. Strangely, it does run. Okay, let me just do a save, control S, and then build and run it. Again, it builds and runs. Let me just... Uh, uh, where is it? Does this work? Control B and this one, and then run it. It works again. Let's build it. Okay, so let's just go ahead and reset it. You can you can reopen it by going into the folder where you have saved it. So I have named it Chapter Four Loops, and it's right here. I can open it up from here. Uh, because they were in, because C plus plus standards were enabled, I uh, just remembers it for some strange reason. Okay, so we got it there. Ah, surprisingly, it does build and run. Uh, with status minus C... Okay, there was a problem here. Process terminated with status, blah, blah, blah. Forget about that. Checking for existence. Yep, it does work. Anyway, I have pre-compiled it before and I would need to actually delete the whole thing and then redo it just to show you that it doesn't actually uh, work, but I can't leave it. I really can't. I have to. I have to make a proof. Otherwise, I will have shamed myself. Okay, let's... I've just copied the entire... Pro I just copied the entire main file and let's open up code blocks. You don't have to do this. I just I'm just making a proof of concept here. Uh, project. Uh, it's gonna be C plus plus. Sure, it's gonna be tra la 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 la. Okay, no semicolon shouldn't be there. Like this. Okay, finish. Goodbye, standard main, and welcome our project. Ah, there you go. So, error. You see, here it says, red lines, error. Range-based for loops are not allowed in C++ 98 mode. So, you do indeed require C++ 11 in order for this to compile. And here, let me just prove it by going into compiler one more time. C++ 11 ISO, okay. And let's run. There we go. It, now it works. Sorry, I don't find my way around code blocks that easily. I, I'm really out of shape in terms of code blocks. I haven't used it in a very long time, uh, but it's best used for learning. And then later on, people generally tend to move to something else. But it's really nice for learning. Anyway, there you go. I have proven what I have stated. I didn't leave it. I just take my word for it. Anyway, I shall see you in the follow-up tutorial where we shall deal with break and continue. What they are, how they function, and what we use them for, I'll explain that in the follow-up tutorial.